I V M. We would like to thank HDFC Life Insurance for supporting this show. HDFC Life Insurance has created an online video series called Behind the Journey with some of the most interesting people from the creative and entertainment industry. It explores the stories that are behind the glitz and glamour of the spotlight and screaming fans. Let's listen to a snippet from the episode featuring Olympic medalist Sakshi Malik. सेविंग्स और इन्वेस्टमेंट में भी डिसिप्लिन चाहिए होता है जैसे रेसलिंग में है कि वो तुरंत रिजल्ट नहीं मिलता है सालों साल लगते हैं जो भी हमने ड्रीम uh, सोचा जो हमें गोल अचीव करना है उसको पूरा करने के लिए लाइक साक्षी सेड इन्वेस्टमेंट एंड सेविंग्स रिक्वायर्स एज मच डिसिप्लिन एज एथलेटिक्स यू कैन वॉच ऑल एपिसोड ऑफ बिहाइंड द जर्नी ऑन एच डी एफ सी लाइफ इंश्योरेंस यूट्यूब चैनल दैट्स यूट्यूब डॉट कॉम स्लैश एच डी एफ सी लाइफ Take control of your personal goals with HDFC Life Insurance's financial solutions. Plan now with HDFC Life Insurance. Terms and conditions apply. HDFC Life Insurance Company Limited, IRDAI Registration Number One Zero One. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru. and we like bringing fresh perspectives to indian affairs and indian perspectives to global affairs so grab a cup of coffee sit back and join us for today's chat hello and welcome to all things policy the takshashila institution is a think tank and our work here is mostly focused on the present and the future but there are times when we find that we really need to go back into the past to understand our present much better i'm joined today by anirudh and uh, He and I are working on a Indian military history podcast called Yuddha, which will be out very soon. It will be out next Wednesday, and you guys should absolutely check it out because it's going to be super awesome. Shush! And in the process of uh, researching for this podcast, uh, we've actually come across some very interesting material regarding India's social history. And Anirudh uh, came across a really interesting inscription uh, from 1264. Am I right? Mm-hmm. And uh, this seems to throw a much more complex light on how uh, religions interacted in medieval India. Mm-hmm. Uh, so tell us about it. So I think I should probably tell you the story of how I came across the inscription first because it's kind of an interesting story. So the Delhi Sultanate, as as you can imagine, is is a very controversial sort of polity in Indian history. Uh, generally speaking, uh, it's kind of brushed under the carpet. It's it's violent past. The its military strategy is not something that's just generally um, known very well or very well talked about in the public domain. And in the process of researching for Yuddha, I happened to be reading about uh, how exactly the Delhi Sultanate went about legitimizing itself in the city of Delhi. And interestingly, in, interestingly enough, it turns out that some of the things it was doing architecturally are obviously a continuation of pre-existing Indian traditions. I mean, sure, those guys were smashing temples and building mosques out of them. Let's not cut corners around that. But they were also doing stuff like uh, finding victory pillars that have been raised by older Indian kings and setting. them up in delhi in a way that rajput kings are also known to have done at roughly the same time and i was reading a paper about this when i happened to come across a throwaway mention of an inscription in gujarat from the 13th century as you mentioned and the footnote kind of said that um this shed some light on the interaction of hindus and muslims and specifically the way that uh, markers of identity worked in the medieval period i kind of put out of my mind and really think that anything would really come out of it but then later on in that paper it mentioned the author of that chapter about the inscription in a different context and i was like hmm this person's work seems interesting so i looked up her academia.edu profile and it turns out that she very generously put up a chapter about this inscription where she analyzes uh, the content of it and makes some very very interesting points indeed so that's basically what i'm here to talk about Okay so now we know how you came across this uh, inscription but what does this inscription say why should we care Well think about this it's an inscription that was commissioned by an arab merchant it was commissioned to commemorate the foundation of a mosque and to assign certain uh, endowments to it to kind of establish who the waqf board governing it was but it's a bilingual inscription it's made in both sanskrit and in arabic 
And what is most fascinating about the Sanskrit portion of this inscription is what it tells us about the way that all these societies, uh, all these social groups were working in an Indian context. Because you see this Arab merchant who very evidently seems to have friendships with the people of the city where he's making this donation. Interestingly enough, that city is Somnath, which I'm sure that our listeners are familiar with. It's most famous because Mahmud of Ghazni is, is known to have sacked and destroyed the temple there, which was later rebuilt. Um, but think about it. In the first place, this is barely a century or two after Mahmud's invasion. Now you have a Arab merchant who is a Muslim who is making a, a grant of a mosque. But he's not making it under the authority of some sultan. He's making it with the full approval of the great merchants of the city of Somnath. And in fact, in the Sanskrit portion of his inscription, he actually mentions the um, Hindu ruler of Gujarat, who is the Maharaja Dhiraja Arjuna Deva of the Chalukya dynasty. Not to be confused with the Chalukyas. Very, very, very different people. Everybody confuses them. And okay, I'm not, I'm not going to get too pedantic <laughs> right now. Um, but that's that's interesting, right? First of all, the fact that um, to gain authority to grant this land, the Arab merchant who is making it is referring to the authority of the king of Gujarat, who happens to be Hindu. Clearly, he doesn't really see a contradiction there. Second, the people of the town of Somanath, all the rich merchants who are actually supporting him in making this grant, don't really see a problem with helping this guy to do this, even though there must still have been people who remembered stories of this terrible sack of the city and so on and so forth. Clearly, these medieval Indians didn't necessarily think about ethnicity and religious markers the way that we do today. So that is one interesting point. But what is most, most fascinating about this inscription to me is the fact that it kind of shows you how these people were translating religious and social concepts across these huge cultural gulfs. Um, so for example, uh, the Sanskrit version of the inscription begins with an obeisance to Vishwanatha, uh, Shunya Rupa, so Lord of the Universe, one whose form is the void, who, which are terms that you generally uh, think, you, you, that you generally associate with Shiva, right? But then a little later in the inscription, uh, it says that this Vishwanatha that it's referring to was worshipped by the followers of the Bodhaka Rasula Mahamada, which means the followers of the good prophet Muhammad. Yes. Which is so interesting to me to think that there's this kind of... Um, equation of this Vedantic concept of Godhead with Allah and clearly that implies that there was a dialogue between religions clearly this Arab merchant and his friends who were helping him make this inscription understood that look anybody who comes here and reads this inscription has got to understand what it's for so how do we make them understand that this is a place of worship how do we make them understand that this is dedicated to God you describe Allah using the same terms that Hindus are using to describe their God. You know, none of this is terribly surprising. We had a very interesting episode out on Tuesday, uh, just earlier this week, uh, about the long-term politics of the Middle East. Hmm. And we talked about how this region was so uh, deeply connected with uh, the subcontinent, with the Indian subcontinent. And if you look at uh, where this merchant came from, uh, he came from Hormuz, hmm. uh, which is in Iran. And... Uh, Hormuz and the west coast of India have really had these very deep trade links forever. And uh, so it's not, so it would seem to me that when this person came to India, it was not unusual. And they understood that this person was, say, different from, uh, say, raiders from the north. Yeah. It wasn't, uh, religion was cer certainly wasn't the sole marker of identity. Exactly. And, it, and, and given the fact that this guy is, use, he's, his inscription is supported by other merchants, uh, that they are participating in making this endowment, it would certainly seem that the professional identification of these people who are engaged in the same sort of trade was far more important to them in forming friendships and forming uh, not just ties of business but also personal ties, religious ties uh, than other markers of identity which is not necessarily the way that we think about the medieval period today. Very often uh, when it comes to the, the Sultanate period, this Hindu and Muslim interaction is portrayed almost as a sort of very hostile binary or is portrayed as this perfect world where everybody 
everybody got together and it was so pluralistic and everybody had so much tehzeeb and oh my god we were so cultured back then which is utter nonsense <laughs> it's the idea that what we call composite culture was was born uh, at once in full perfection and uh, and never changed since then i cannot count the number of times i've heard people say oh the essence of india's pluralism that's clearly not the case because as as i think our listeners would have figured by now it's not necessarily pluralism and acceptance of all things that is the case but rather a much more sort of calculated translation uh, a much deeper sort of engagement with identity identities aren't necessarily fluid um, this man is not saying that he's a hindu uh, and his friends are not saying that they are muslims their their identities are still integral to who they are their identities haven't fundamentally changed but they've developed the tools required to make their identities communicate and that if you think about it if you think about the broader history of india that is the underlying theme it's not just this simplistic pluralism or the simplistic conflict between one social group or another it's about this very nuanced complicated interest driven sort of dialogue and in the world of western indian ocean merchants uh, this sort of dialogue would have actually been simpler uh, for 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 one everybody understood the common language of commerce uh, they understood the rhythm of trade uh, they had uh, ways of bargaining with each other and having coming to long term understanding for providing goods that could be traded you know but you do mention that uh, allah is described as vishwanatha to me that sounds pretty plural right <laughs> well that's what i thought as well i mean that my initial reaction to this was like oh my god our our ancestors were so tolerant my, like i'm so proud to be part of this tradition uh, but then <laughs> i kept reading and i took a look at the arabic inscription now the arabic inscription has the usual uh, formulaic uh, wish that um, Somnath should become one of the cities of Islam uh, and expresses a desire for the banishment of disbelief and idols. Uh, so <laughs> clearly our, our our Arab friend here hasn't really changed his fundamental religious beliefs. So he's he's happy to live with this uh, society that he's he's essentially become part of that he's made friends in uh, but he's not willing to budge on that basic formulaic adherence to the idea that yes Islam is really more dominant. Um so there's that. The, the, he clearly has not <laughs> backed off on that important point. Can you tell us more about the Arabic inscription? How is it different? How different is it from the Sanskrit inscription? So it's it's actually quite interesting. There's some tweaks here and there. Um, first of all, it's far less detailed in terms of like the in in terms of describing how the property was acquired. In terms of describing who are the social groups that are supposed to be maintaining it. In terms of describing the nitty gritties of the endowment. Who are the folks who are going to be administering it? What are the terms of the grant and so on and so forth? Whereas the Sanskrit inscription goes into a lot more detail about that. Now if you think about it why would why would this be the case simply speaking is because the sanskrit inscription is meant to be read by the officials of the chalukyas since they are the ones who are going to be enforcing the terms of the grant the arabic inscription doesn't really matter to them so much they can't even in fact we don't even know if these guys could read the arabic script which is probably why our friend put in that very nice wish that somnath should become an islamic city <laughs> um but it's that's that's not all of it right so why, why was that di- the difference there um the author makes a very interesting argument the author by the way her, her name is uh, alka patel and you guys should absolutely look her up she's fascinating um but the argument that she makes is if you look at the broader um, arabic Persian world these guys were used to keeping record of property rights and so on and so forth on paper whereas in india uh, if you look at land grants it's all done on copper plates it's done on inscriptions that you find in temples and so on and so forth so what you're seeing here is is uh, is two things it's manifold you're seeing both the different ways of thinking about recording property and enforcing property rights and you're also seeing uh, different sorts of priorities now the arabic inscription doesn't go into that much detail about who is going to be maintaining the site for example whereas the sanskrit inscription does um, and it it even mentions groups like lime burners and plasterers and so oh. on and so forth it mentions that sailors are expected to uh, to take care of this now who are the sailors that could possibly referring to it's probably indian sailors who had converted to islam but didn't yes. know how to read arabic script and were probably more familiar with uh, either sanskrit or somebody who could translate something from sanskrit into uh, whatever language i mean i'm assuming it was some earlier form of gujarati um which is again it, it it's indicative of the fact that our merchant friend really understood stands the social dynamics here so what the what the sanskrit inscription says is that our merchant friend built it for the merit of his father whereas what the 
Arabic inscription says is that he built it for his own merit, which again is indicative of the fact that he understands that okay, Indians uh, Indians need uh, this sort of respect to be shown to their father and so on and so forth. Um, and also the fact that he chooses to mention his father at all implies that there were people there who still remembered who his father was, which says something about the long-lasting kind of intergenerational nature of this commercial and quite possibly friendly relationship. All right. But, you know, a lot of this sounds very shrewd, more than friendly. Hmm. These sound like more like wily merchants than uh, best buddies. I am absolutely certain that these guys are not fools. They are certainly very wily people. But again, the inscription provides evidence to that. It heaps praise upon one chap called uh, Sri Chada. I'm not sure if that's how I'm, if, if that's the correct pronunciation. But both the Arabic and the Sanskrit versions mention him. And they just heap praise on him for his generosity. And from his name, you can tell he's obviously an Indian guy and in the Sanskrit inscription they mention his relationship with the Arabic merchant they say the relationship is one of Dharma Bandhava which means a, a bond of Dharma which seems almost like a, a ritual tie something something very very deep um which is kind of surprising uh, because bo- according to both orthodox interpretation of Hinduism as well as orthodox interpretation of uh, interpretations of Islam, it's kind of frowned upon to be having these kind of interactions. Um, if you're sitting and interacting with a mlecha, a, cl- a casteless one, then you are losing your ritual purity. If you're an Arab and you're uh, hanging out with the... You're, you're not supposed to be uh, interacting with somebody who is not a person of the book. Uh, those guys are basically kafirs. Uh, and even if they're uh, considered to be a people of the book, a dhimmi, you're, it's kind of frowned upon to be having business dealings with them, uh, to be treating them as equals, essentially. Yeah, but you know, the cynical part of me wants to say they owed this guy something and so spoke of him in such uh, uh, glowing terms. That's certainly possible. But if you look at the number of merchants that he mentions, I find a little difficult to believe that one single Arab guy could have leverage over these many Indian merchants in Indian port. Especially given that the commercial dominance of the Indian Ocean was, wasn't was really, I mean, you don't really have a single actor dominating the sure. Indian Ocean sure. until until maybe the Portuguese arrive. Um, it was very much a relationship of equals. And I think that the most, the simplest explanation that makes the most sense is to just take this guy at his word and like say, you might have been a genius. You might have been a, a very, very cunning financier. He mentions that he owns two oil mills in Somnath and all that, that he's giving uh, to the mosque to, to, up, to uphold its, its maintenance and so on and so forth. So clearly, a very wealthy guy. He, he has property in Hormuz. He has property in Somnath. Who, who, this he's guy living was, the life. Exactly. He was he was a high flyer of his days, man. He was the he would go around on these high-powered executive meetings on his on his fancy ship, which was probably decorated with all kinds of, you know, uh, bells and gold and pearls. And, and colorful banners and so on and so forth. But evidently, I, I think it absolutely makes sense to just take him at his word when he says that this Chada guy was his Dharma Bandhava because um, evidently this Chada is a member of the Waqf board. Why would he be getting um, a senior Hindu merchant to be on the board to administer this mosque if not for the fact that he had a personal connection with him and was able to ask him to do this for him? Yeah, this again seems to highlight to me the sheer complexity of history. Uh, the past is at least as complex as the present. And, uh, you know, it's it was possible in that world of of religious intolerance, frankly, uh, for people across religious across the religious divide to uh, strike up friendships, to strike up partnerships. But going back to what we we're talking about, whether this was pluralism or whether this was people maintaining the integrity of of their own identities. Uh, But are there more examples of uh, such interactions between individuals and groups? I fully understand the cynicism to be of believing that hmm, maybe medieval Indians were more complex than we would like to give them credit for. Uh, But we have examples from, say, the 9th century. uh, And this is from a different place. It's from the southern part of Gujarat, around the town of Sanjan. Um, And this is from the time of the Rashtrakuta Emperor Indra III. And as as, as everybody knows, I'm a huge Rashtrakuta nerd. Uh, In Indra is, uh, is a, one of the most more interesting Rashtrakuta warlords. He leads an expedition in North India, actually supposed to have sacked and burned Kanauj of all places. Um, and this inscription explicitly mentions a chap called Madhumati, 
who is which is obviously a sanskritized version of muhammad uh, mentions him as a great captain of ships um, so it would seem that he was probably a merchant or maybe some kind of a uh, mercenary sailor or something maybe a captain a captain of a mercenary sailor company um, who managed to like strike up some contacts with the rashtrakutas and uh, who the rashtrakutas thought would be a good guy to be at the governor of sanjan uh, because he's recorded to have uh, defeated uh, enemies on sea and so on and so forth so maybe this guy was a special in taking out pirates um and it even mentions the stuff that madhumati did which are again things that seem strikingly indian he sets up a, a free ferry and he also sets up a free feeding house where people get rice ghee and curries and him the inscription that mentions him and mentions his governorship even mentions his friendship with this very well connected brahmin gentleman who's built a temple in the city of sanjan and clearly this madhumati or muhammad doesn't really have a problem with that so as i said there are multiple ways of interpreting this you could of course interpret as say hey look how pluralistic indians were uh, we gave this guy permission or you can say oh look how foolish indians were why do you trust these evil people from who have come from across the seas or as i'm choosing to do you can look at muhammad as somebody who has understood the polities of india understood how they work has managed to ease his way into the circles of power and the inscription commemorates success at doing that using the language that is usually reserved for indian vassals for indian warlords once again the cynical part of me wants to say that uh, these elites in the end found that that despite their religious uh divide despite the religious divide between them they had more in common with each other than with the great unwashed oh absolutely and if you think about it they kind of still do uh so th- that's another thing about indian history that hasn't really changed this dichotomy of hindu and muslim at various levels i think doesn't really hold up whether you're looking at merchants whether you're looking at the average person on the streets because if you look about it i mean a very very large percentage of muslims in india actually come from the lower caste which wouldn't really be the case if it was just a elite interaction but then you also see a lot of elite indians who are muslims which wouldn't have been the case if it was just the lower classes being converted so clearly what you're seeing is this very wide cross section of indian society uh, that finds islam interesting enough to actually practice it and you see an equally wide cross section of indian society that doesn't see them as any less indian or as being somehow at odds with existing indian social practice or social principles where they're able to live with them they're able to integrate them and they're able to work with them while at the same time choosing not to be muslim exactly um there's they clearly acknowledge that difference um of course the muslims will say that oh yes yes yeah, we we are better than the hindus and of course the hindus will say that uh, we are better than those barbarians who come in blah 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 but um that's all on text if you actually look at the evidence of the interaction you see absolutely crazy stuff you see uh, the ghorid sultans who are given such a terrible rap probably deservedly for doing stuff like you know burning nalanda and killing all these armies of rajputs in north india and so on and so forth they are issuing coins with hindu deities on them uh, so even though their court poets will say all kinds of uh, say oh, oh yeah the sultan was was graced by god and was able to drive these evil barbarians into the sea and destroyed all their idols and so on and so forth and hindus hindu kings will say stuff like oh and the, these these barbarian blechas they they submerged the earth into darkness and we rescued it and and the, the, the everywhere uh, the, there were the skulls hanging from the trees and and the smell of of roasted flesh was spreading everywhere <laughs> but, you know i again yes all right but i i just can't help but think as perhaps someone you know perhaps reflecting the cynicism of the early 21st century i can't help but think that uh, these same rulers when they uh, uh, got down face to face to talk to each other they understood power they recognized it and uh, they honored it i have a great example of this actually we'll we'll talk about this in much greater detail in yuddha so you guys should absolutely check that out but here's a little bit of a teaser mahmud of ghazni uh, widely like reviled as this kind of barbarian from the sand from afghanistan who comes and just destroys all these glorious temples and so on and so forth which he does let's let's let's, let's be honest um 
And so Mahmud manages to kind of corner this Indian king in the fort of Kalanja, which is in Uttar Pradesh, uh, specifically in the Bundelkhand region. And it's a very well fortified area. Like it's it's known to have um, plenty of water, plenty of food, lots of elephants and so on and so forth. So Mahmud knows that, you know, he, he can't really do anything about it. He, and he can't afford to keep waiting for too long because he's going to end up extending his supply chains. Uh, it might risk that an uh, Indian army is going to come and cut him off from Afghanistan and the smash his army. So Mahmud knows that you know he can't stay there for too long and the Indians realize this as well so what do they do they talk they talk let's parley <laughs> and what and it's it's so fascinating to see how this happens um, the Indian king actually writes a poem and gives it to Mahmud so he's clearly indicating that look I'm, I'm a I'm a literator I'm a highly sophisticated person and here I am honoring you as an equal and I'm writing something in praise of you. And what does Mahmud, this this barbarous invader who destroys temples every second day that he can, uh, what does he do in response? He gives the king a firman saying, I confirm you in your position uh, and I'm going to go now. Bye-bye. They recognize power, as you said. So clearly the history of Islam in India is way more complicated than the charged narratives that we hear today uh, allow for. And uh, it's not it's not a fairy tale, uh, but it's it's really fascinating. Mm-hmm. And I think it has a, speaks to us a great deal about the present. And we should just understand it in all its complexity. Thank you so much, Anirudh. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on All Things Policy. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM Network. You can tune into them on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, Check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST. I hope you enjoyed that show. We'd like to thank our sponsors on the network this week. Thank you, HDSC Live, for coming on board. Also, would like to thank Storytel for continuing the long time advertising that they've been doing with us. And if you have a brand and you'd like to advertise with us, please send us an email. We'd love to talk to you. And let me tell you a couple of things that you should check out this week. On What Up Player, Siddhartha and Mikhail talk about the India Australia series and discuss who's better between Virat Kohli and Steve Smith. On States of Anarchy, Hamsini is joined by Vineet Hegre to discuss the crisis and dispute mechanisms at the World Trade Organization. On Simplified Shorties, Chuck, Naren and Shriket welcome their new co-host, Tony Sebastian. On Advertising is Dead, Varun talks to film critic Sucharita Tyagi, known for the popular Not A Review film series on Film Companion. On Agla Station Adulthood, Ritasha asks Ayushi 36 questions. Udipan Sarma joins Zarina on the Empowering series. He's the lead singer of the band as we keep searching. Thanks and keep listening. Do you wish you were smarter? Well, so do we. But the next best thing? We could make you sound smarter. And to help you with this endeavor, we are Simplified. A podcast uh, that attempts to break down the complex world around you with a little knowledge, a lot of poor jokes and a ton of random trivia. Episodes out every Monday. On the IVM podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts. See ya!